The ADA has been a watershed in American disability policy with far-reaching effects on the status of Americans with disabilities, but has fallen far short from the expectations for social transformation with which it was enacted in 1990. The individuals who were interviewed in the following film you're about to see and hear will offer their deeply personal stories about living their lives with various types of disabilities. Some will tell you how they cope with their frustrations and celebrate their successes, and others how they have become self-advocates to promote greater inclusion for people with disabilities. But within the context of each interview, the single sentiment that all share as people with disabilities is that their personhood is shadowed by the social perception of disabilities. As one interviewee, Anne, expressed, my blindness is a part of who I am, but does not define me as a person. Here, in their own words, yesterday, today, tomorrow, 25 years after the ADA. Osteogenesis imperfecta. I hear voices, um, I'm a manic depressant, I'm very depressed some days. I was born with uh, uveal colobomas in uh, both eyes. I have cerebral palsy. When I was 18, I had a truck tire blew up in my face. I was with my motorcycle club for Saken MC. We was hanging out one night and we was on our way from an, uh, an event and somehow it started raining and as far as I remember that said. My disability, that's kind of a strange question because really I'm not disabled. But for the purposes of this, I understand your question. So, you know, I'm considered deaf. Well, I lost my sight as the result of a car accident back in July 16, 1993. My condition is congenital. It's a genetic condition, disorder. Uh, it's called diastrophic dysplasia, or when I was growing up, it was commonly referred to as diastrophic dwarfism. Back in 1982, I was in a car accident. I was visually impaired. Uh, from the time I was born. Mm -hmm. um, I just never knew it. I had suffered from a traumatic brain injury. I got a, my right arm amputated above the elbow, my right leg above the knee. A huge change in my life. You know, I was very independent, you know, lived on my own with my family, and woke up one day and I was all gone. I went to school at uh, Temple University in Philadelphia at a time when it was very hard to do college. Uh, because there were so many inaccessible campuses. I graduated with a, a degree in English. Mm. And I would have graduated with a degree in education, which was what I really wanted, except that I was told by my um, counselor there at Temple that she had called every school in a pretty wide radius around Philadelphia and there wasn't anybody who would accept me as a student teacher. When I was a kid, I remember if you went into a restaurant, you sometimes would be seated apart from everyone else if you could get into the restaurant. I was sent to a nursing home. For that place, they held me there, just had me basically laying around for a long period of time. And then when I finally did get up and started to get together mentally, to tell them, hey, I want to walk, I want to, you know, I want to feed myself, I want to clean myself, I want to do this, I want to do that. They basically, they basically washed me away. They basically didn't try to help me much with that. That doesn't happen so much anymore. Uh, curb cuts are pretty much universal, uh, particularly in a place like White Plains. Um, we have paratransit, uh, accessible taxi cabs, uh, not only in our community, but throughout the country. I think it was a landmark legislation. I think it has helped break down a lot of barriers. The ADA, due to, you know, the, the wording, reasonable accommodations, opened a lot for people like me. Then ADA was passed and it did change things dramatically. <laughs> and I could see that it was much easier for people to live after the ADA was passed. 
especially I'm very pleased at the progress that Apple has done as well as Microsoft. Um, the Apple products, with the, uh, the iPhone, the iPad, the accessibility options, um, the zoom, the zoom in function where you, they just added a, uh, a magnification program on Windows where you can make the screen as big as you want. Also in Office, Word, Excel, PowerPoint comes with a, um, a feature on the lower right hand corner where you can zoom in on the screen and it's just great where you can just sit back. You know, not like the old days where I had a pretty much kiss the screen. <laughs> video phone, we call it VP video phone, that the ADA from Title IV was access to communication, and the federal government required that we would have access to what was called a video relay service. So I could call hearing people through this video relay service. And what would happen is I make a phone call to a doctor's office. But I don't call directly to the phone number. I call and see on the screen a video interpreter with headphones and a microphone. And I sign to them that I want to make an appointment, please. And they call and speak to the doctor's office. And then they answer, and they sign the answer back to me. And it goes through that third person. And that's amazing, because I can make phone calls myself. I can have that before the ADA. That wasn't a mandate. Right now, I'm working two days a week at Walmart. I got back to a disability agency. And basically, I spent a lot of having the sold clothes and that kind of thing. And I know I can do a, I was made to do a whole lot more than I went to Italy on my own in 2007, uh, completely without a tour group, without a traveling companion. This was my three-part adventure uh, for a three-part celebration, getting my master's degree, turning 40, and my honeymoon for one because I can't wait forever. In my 20s, they had, had a typing course, which is very important. And we need to put money towards that. So I can tell you, in the beginning at that time, what they would do is they would get you into a training program to train you for a job, and then you get a job through them. And that program would be your resume, and they would look for jobs for you. That's how she and I met. Life in general is hard. And then to have sure. the disability to, um, you know, struggle with too is, is a lot. I hear voices, I have hallucinations sometimes, you know, but... I don't know if I want another life. I don't know that I could live being another person. I guess you'd have to be another person to find out, but I've always had them with me, and I've always functioned with them. I'm actually grateful to a lot of them because they, they do so much that I can't do. Westchester is having a Hearing Voices group. I'm going to be running a group called Hearing Voices so that we all sit around and we talk about our voices and what we're doing to feel better about ourselves and um, how in England it's accepted that people talk to themselves, but the United States is very uncommon and we're, we're stigmatized and looked at as um, crazy and we're actually just not crazy. Um, and so I'm very excited about that because now I get to maybe let's just say cross another plateau of not being ashamed of having to have a disability. After my time in the hospital, which was you know, very beneficial because it gave me the time I needed to recover, the strength I needed to get back on my feet. After going home, I got into the program with Lighthouse for the Blind in Miami, because I grew up in uh, North Miami Beach, Florida. And uh, Lighthouse taught me how to do everything. They taught me how to use a long white cane. They taught me how to type using touch typing system versus hunting and pecking, pecking, which is what I did before I lost my sight. Taught me how to read braille. They taught me how to write braille. Taught me how to cook, how to clean, how to pretty much do everything, live my life, you know, how it's possible for me to live my life independently. So I got my first guide dog. What I didn't expect after I got my first guide dog was the fight that would come after that. I knew because of you know the benefit of the ADA, 
and the uh, the legality of you know guide dogs and service dogs to be allowed everywhere that there should be no problem. I should never really have to fight for anything. But I learned when I got my first dog that there would be fights. And I'm sorry to say the first fight I ever had was with my school system. <laughs> they didn't want me to go back to high school. Not back to my high school, at least. They said, you're vision impaired. We have a special program in a different school. You will go there. And my reaction was, no. Why am I going to go to a different school? I know the school. I've been there you know, for two years previously. I literally have a map in my mind. I haven't done it you know, without sight, but I remember it visually. Why are you going to throw me into a setting that would make me truly blind? I had several friends in Wichita that were wood carvers, and they were stupid enough to give me a sharp knife. <laughs> and we took over from there and started out with small stuff, you know, just to, cheap set of tools from Hobby Lobby and and graduated into the menagerie of knives that I have now. It's still a work in progress and always will be. You know, the thing with, with life in general is you get out of it what you put into it. Like I, I, ADA, you know, has come a long way. They've got a long ways to go. It's, it's always going to be an uphill battle and no matter what we do because everything changes. But I think they, the, the framers of the legislation and Congress didn't go far enough in terms of spelling out remedies and making things easy for people to follow in terms of guidelines for building with access codes. We're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the ADA. Do you think the Americans with Disability Act has affected you? Has, have I you have done very well to help. And cerebral palsy comes in various degrees and that a lot of people confuse cerebral palsy. They feel like if something is wrong here, there's something wrong here. And, uh, and that's because there is a serious lack of education I want to is. And that's what we need to do for the young people that's just and, starting yeah. out. And it's not just that, okay? It's not just that. Like I said, going back to these training programs, you need to be able to do that. Because some of these jobs that they get people, all right, we're at a point where we're going to be retiring for years, so it's not going to matter. When you get these young kids in their 20s, how are you going to be able to live doing a job, doing bagging, doing cart stuff like that? You're going to want to get them into some kind of an entry-level job. That's where they need to be able to get. So they're going to need to have these skills because everything is getting more and more computerized and all this kind of stuff. And for somebody that's really disabled, they give up after a while. Like I said to you before, there's so many people out there with disability that don't can't find a job and they feel like that they're not important part of society. Now you can go into an elevator anywhere and you can have a you can you have braille and you have large print numbers and you know, I remember there are, there are still elevators that I go into sometimes and there's no braille. For instance, if I wanted to go to I don't know, Austin, Texas and I want to take a walk down from the hotel and there aren't any accessible signals for me to know, you know, with those streets how they c I can cross them. That prevents me from doing what everybody else does, which is take a stroll down the street and see what's going on. That's, that's a barrier. When I first moved here uh, 21 years ago, I'd never lived entirely on my own. And so I had to adjust to an environment that was not designed for me at all. Um, yes, the building has an elevator. Yes, there's a ramp that goes down from the parking lot, but inside here, I had to deal with daunting tasks like cooking. And for a long time, I, I hardly ever used the stove top because it was, um, as you can see, over my head. Um, and I never made, so I never made anything like eggs or pasta. And then one day I remembered 
that my mother used to have some pots and pans made by pirates and they were clear this one actually is amber colored and they don't make them anymore so I had to go onto the internet go to eBay and find an old Pyrex saucepan you'd be surprised how hard it was people loved them um, and I don't think it's just little people in wheelchairs I think people like to see what they're cooking and so I bought one at great expense and um, now I can make my eggs and make my pasta. The sink is also on the other side over my head. And so I have a stick that I use to turn on the faucet, turn off the faucet. I use the stick for a lot of things. It's, I, it would not be an exaggeration to say that I couldn't live here independently if I didn't have that stick. <laughs> They call me Bond. James Bond. I think that architects and designers need to be more aware of the needs of people who have physical and other challenges. You know, there are standards for buildings, there are standards for appliances, but there's no standards for people. These units were supposed to be built with knowing that some residents might have disabilities and my unit was considered this unit for somebody who was disabled because it had wider bathroom doors mm -hmm. but yet they put a bathtub uh. <laughs> in the apartment unit and the ramp that we came down this morning to the common areas that we pay common charges for originally had steps as you have just heard from the individuals in this film, the ADA has positively impacted many of them in significant ways, while others have expressed that it hasn't done enough to remove the social barriers that prevent their full inclusion in community life. Although the Americans with Disabilities Act is a crucial landmark piece of civil rights legislation, it can do a lot more to address attitudes and acceptance which contribute to stereotypical biases that keep people with disabilities in institutions against their will and deny them opportunities for gainful employment. Today, as we celebrate 25 years of evolving equal opportunities for people with disabilities, let us also be attentive to the work ahead that still remains to be done. Thanks everyone. But we still have a long way to go. So support the ADA so that one day we can achieve equality. Ending credits roll. Writer Lisa Terracone, produced and directed by Chaz Menendez and Chelsea Marr. Producers Susan W. Cole, Liz Mark, Lisa Terracone. Interviewer Susan W. Cole, Cole Communications PR and Marketing. Narrator and flutist, Paul Witowski. Special thanks to Yuga. Original score, Lou Barisi, Paul Witowski, Chaz Menendez. ASL interpreter, Lynn Martirano. Special thanks, Robin and Robert Baldera, Marcus Blackmore, Ann Chiapetta, Rob Sicoria, Deborah Cole, Ron Davidson, Scott Greenblatt, Kamrita Hill, Akil Lukasian, Kyle Larson, Rich Manley, and Jerry Mariano. This has been another Up Against the Wall production.
Copyright 2015 Westchester Disability Advocacy Partnership.